Because opposition, yes, will come. But even in the midst of that, we hold on to the truest truth that I know. And it's unwavering, it's unshakable. And so we can still experience joy even in the midst of the press against us. It doesn't mean we put on the plastic smile and pretend. It means that even in our sorrow, we can trust that he is there with us. It means even in our pain, that he's not absent. That he's walking alongside us. Good morning. <clears throat> We're reading from Acts chapter 13, verses 26 through 33, A. Uh, in ESV. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every, every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that was from God promised to the fathers. This he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. You can sit. Uh, well, we, we are here on, on Palm Sunday. Um, Palm Sunday, a day that holds a lot of significance. It kicks us off into the Holy Week. And as you already heard, we're going to be celebrating on, on Good Friday. We'll come together and we'll remember the cross. We'll move into Sunday where we will have the, the sun rise as, as we come and start our day in worship of the Lord. And then we'll have two services where we just uh, sink in on that truth that Jesus did not stay in that tomb. But all of this kicked off as, as Jesus made his way down the Kidron Valley. He would be coming down from the Mount of Olives. And as he was coming and making his way towards the city, he was riding on a donkey. Now, Jesus, who was so careful with every word that he spoke, so intentional with every thought, this was not an accident. He didn't make a mistake. He couldn't find a horse that was big enough for him. No, this was, this was an image he wanted people to see. See, they knew that someone coming riding in a donkey uh, was the image of a conquering king. And in a moment where thousands of pilgrims are making their way into the city of Jerusalem in preparation for the Passover that was to begin, Jesus comes riding in and all of the imagery of this moment would not have been lost on the people around him. And as he's riding in, uh, the religious leaders of the day, they see the threat this is. Rome sees the threat that this is because he's coming as a king. And what was the people's reaction in this moment? They begin to cheer. They start throwing down their robes, throwing down palm branches, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, save us. This is the one we've been waiting for. And all of the noise would be coming towards Jesus and all of this excitement. But what we see is that really the water had just begun to boil in the city that is Jerusalem. And by the end of the week, all that had culminated to this very moment would burst into an uproar. And Jesus, as he's drawing near, Jesus, as he's coming into this city, uh, what's his reaction? Well, we're told in Luke that, that he wept. He's looking out. He said, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Even then, Jesus could see. He knew what was coming. He knew what he would face. He knew the opportunity that was before each and every person there. And he also knew the many that would reject it. The pain and the sorrow. The missed opportunity of so many. And as we draw into our passage today, as we step into Acts 13 and we begin in verse 13, we will experience that same joy, that same sorrow, that same tragedy, that same triumph. Because we'll see that it all comes down to this tipping point, an opportunity to step into life with Jesus, to receive him or to reject him. 
And so as we turn to Acts chapter 13, verse 13, let me just begin by praying for us today. Father, as we come and we enter into this week, Lord, we fix our eyes on you. Lord, we rejoice in what you accomplished and what you've overcome, but we also see the great cost at which it came. And so, Lord, as we look to your word this morning, would you speak to us? Would you enliven our hearts to your truth? Father, as each of us in this room comes to a tipping point, at, at some moment in our lives where we have to decide, do I, do I trust in you or do I not? Lord, I pray that each of us would taste and see that you are good, that your way is true, and that in you is life. We love you and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we pick up in verse 13 where we left off last week. In verse 13 and 14, it says, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. Now, if you remember, we left them last week on the island of Cyprus. The map up here is going to show you the journey that they took to get to where we were last week, that they left from Antioch, that little A that's kind of squeaking out there. That's Antioch, Syrian Antioch. It's important to keep that in mind. They go down to Seleucia, down to Salamis, and then they made their way across the island, proclaiming the truth of who Jesus is wherever they could and wherever they were received. And they got to Paphos, which was the heart of the, the capital of Cyprus. And there was Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, the governor of that day. But we come to this conflict where one of his advisors, this Jewish uh, false prophet, this magician, this advisor to the governor, Bar-Jesus was his name, son of salvation, uh, comes to a head with Paul and Barnabas. He starts to call them out and to resist them. And what we see in that moment, what we saw last week, was that suddenly Bar-Jesus is left completely blind. And it was Sergius Paulus, this proconsul, the governor, who would truly see for the first time as he stepped into life with Jesus and believed the truth of the good news about who he was. And so it's from Paphos that they make their way up into Pamphylia. This next map will show us where they go from next. That red line is their journey all the way up. And that little flag up there, that's going to be Perga. And you might be wondering, what's the red line? What's the green line? Well, we're told that Paul, Barnabas, and John, this is John Mark, they all go up. But then John Mark, somewhere along the line, just, just goes back to Jerusalem. And so that's him going all the way down to Jerusalem. We're not told why. We're never given a reason as to why he, he left. There's some, some conjecture as to what that could be. But what we do know is that the reason he left was significant enough that Paul and Barnabas are actually going come to come to a head over this. That there's going to be a rift that we're going to look at in a couple of weeks. So just kind of tuck that away and remember that. And so they come up and they make their way to, to Perga. And then we're told that from uh, Perga to, in Pamphylia that they uh, went to Antioch in Pisidia. So this next map is going to show you all the way up to where they get. So Perga. And if you look, this road that goes all the way up into Antioch was not a, a road that was lightly traveled. Uh, meaning that there was a, a notorious road that took you all the way up there. And the concern was uh, if flash floods could come at any moment. The, the terrain was rough, but also there was robbers and brigands that would hide in the hills. And anyone who came by, they would come down and take whatever they could from them. And so this was a bit of a treacherous pass. And on top of that, where Antioch was located is 3,600 feet above sea level. So they are climbing up all the way to get to this, this city that sat on top of this plateau. Now, the confusion comes in of this is Antioch, but they were, they were sent from Antioch. So how did they get from Antioch to Antioch? Well, the first was Syrian Antioch. This is Antioch in Pisidia. Now, why the two names? Well, King Seleucus, in, in order to honor his father, he actually named 16 cities Antioch after his father Antiochus. Okay, so it built some confusion for those of where you were. And so that's why there's Syrian Antioch and then there's Antioch and Pisidia. You have to distinguish between the two so that people know which one you're talking about. And this city lay in the, the territory of Galatia. 
Now, the reason this matters is because the very people that Paul and Barnabas are going to go and preach to here in Galatia are the very ones that are going to receive the letter to the Galatians that we have in our New Testament. There's also one other little subtle thing in here that goes unnoticed, but it has big implications. Verse 13, it says, now Paul and his companions. This is the first time when Paul and Barnabas are ordered together that Paul is coming first. Up until this point, Barnabas has always come first, which in in the ancient writing, this is a way of saying this was who in charge. Now suddenly we have this shift where Paul is now in charge of the expedition and his leadership takes over from here on out. So they make their way into Antioch in Pisidia and in verse uh, 14, we pick back up and it says, on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and they sat down. So typical of their pattern, they found a synagogue where they can go in, they can find some common ground, they can be a part of a service. And we're told in verse 15 that after the reading from the law and of the prophets, this would have just been a normal service, there would have been a a prayer at the beginning, most likely the prayer at the beginning of the service would have been the Shema, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There would have been a reading from the the prophets and and the law, and then there would have been a short teaching. And in this moment, we're told that the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, sending a message to to Paul and to Barnabas, saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. This is every preacher's dream to walk in somewhere and they're like, "Do do you have any word? Oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. And just imagine, this is this is Paul. They've traveled all of this way, made their way to 3,600 feet above sea level, and now he's sitting in a synagogue, and they're like, do you have anything to say? Go ahead and say it, right? This is like a softball coming at him, and he's so excited. And so verse 16, what do we see? So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. He jumps right in. And what he's doing in this moment is he's addressing the two different audiences that he has in this crowd. He knows that there are many there who are Jewish from birth, that this has just been their life. And coming to the synagogue week after week, that's just who they are. And then there's others, those who fear God, the Gentile converts who've come and started to take place in the synagogue, just finding something new within here. And he said, I'm going to address you both. So, so, So listen to what I have to say. And what Paul is about to unfold, he's going to take us through the history of Judaism, the history of God's movement and his promise to his people and the way that it was working. And he's going to connect the dots using these various anchor points and pillars. And he's going to bring us from the past and to the present and how that affects our future. And so he begins in verse 17. He says, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with uplifted arm he led them out of it. And for about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that he gave them judges, until Samuel the prophet. And so he begins, he starts the story, and it's a story that those in the synagogue were familiar with. This was not new information, but what he's doing, he's building common ground. He's saying, listen, I'm going to tell you the continuation of the story, the promise of God and its fulfillment. And so let me go back to the patriarchs when God called us as a nation to be a light to all other nations, to be blessed, to be a blessing to all other nations. And then he anchors them in the Exodus. You remember when that happened? We were slaves for over 400 years in Egypt and God freed us. And then in our rebellion, we got to wander around in the desert for 40 years. And then he brought us into the promised land, conquering nations on our behalf so that we could have life in him. All this took place in about 450 years. 400 for the the, the enslavement, about 40 for the wanderings, about 10 for the conquests. And he says, and after that, he gave them judges until Samuel, the prophet. See, what he's rehearsing here is he's like, remember all that God, God has already done for us. God has been really good. He's been true to his word up to this point. And he's reminding the people of Israel, God has called you, that he's rescued you, he's led you, he's fought for you. But still, the people were not satisfied. In verse 21, it says, and then they asked for a king. 
They asked for a king. They wanted somebody in charge. And so they go to Samuel the prophet and they're like, we need somebody like all the other nations have. We need somebody who can stand for us and go out in front of us. And we hear this, and those of you who've grown up reading the Bible or are familiar with it, we always read this through our lens of like, I don't understand why they would do that. And yet we do this all the time. We're always looking for a figurehead to carry on our cause. And even when it comes to church, there's this reluctance of, I want to live vicariously through that person, but I'm going to keep some distance between me and God when the story of God has continually been, how can I minimize the space between you and me? You don't need someone in in place of us. Jesus has come so that you can have a relationship with me. And yet we see the people of Israel saying, we need somebody. We need need someone to stand for us. So they asked for a king. And Samuel the prophet, he argued and he told the people, like, this is not good. You you don't understand. A king is going to abuse this power and he's going to abuse you in the process. And God told Samuel, listen, this isn't isn't on you. Okay, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And I'm going to go ahead and give them what they asked for. And so carrying on in verse 21 It says, they asked for a king and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. For 40 years, Saul would rule and reign. Saul, a man who looked the part but really did not have the right heart. He was a head taller than everybody. He he, he was a warrior and, and seemed like the right person and yet he continued to be about himself. And so we read that he, for 40 years, ruled and then... A man of the tribe of Benjamin, picking back up. And when he had removed him, when God had removed Saul, he raised up David to be king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all of my will. Now, Paul is grabbing hold of some of the descriptions we have of David in the Hebrew scriptures that point us to this truth that David was a man after God's heart. But we also have to keep in mind that this is David uh, of David and Goliath fame, right? But also David of David and Bathsheba fame. Like David is no, no saint. He didn't get it all right, but he continued to come before the Lord. And David would become the standard by which all other kings would be measured. And David was the one who who the promise was to come through, that there would be a a king in the line of David who would be the Messiah, the anointed one, the, the chosen one who would rule and reign and bring the peace that everyone had so longed for. And so Paul is just pulling in his listeners. You guys know what I'm talking about. You've you've seen this, what God did throughout history. Then in verse 23, of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior. Jesus, as he promised. Suddenly he starts to make the turn here. They've been with them up to this point, and now this feels like new information to them. Right? They're like, yes, the Hebrew scriptures, we are with you. We know who David is. And now you're telling us that the son of the promise has come? That God has brought about this in the man named Jesus as he had promised. And so Paul now is moving from the past into the present. And he begins to bring Jesus into the picture. That Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise. And so he begins to to unfold this a little bit more. He says, listen, before his coming, verse 24, before his coming, before Jesus came, John, this is John the Baptist now. John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I'm not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am unworthy to untie. See, John is is holding this this gap between the the past and the present, the now and the not yet. And he's bringing the, the hands together of the people of God with the Messiah who is to come. And in true prophetic form, he he knows his place. John's like, I'm not the Messiah. I know who he is. Therefore, he must become greater. I must become less. And John never sought to make much of himself, but always to make much of Jesus. And so Paul is just starting now to weave this story, the gospel narrative, together. And he starts to bring it home. He starts to push on them a little bit. And so he looks around at those in the synagogue. He knows his audience well. And he could probably feel them retreating a little bit like, this is getting dangerous, what you are saying right now. And so verse 26, he pulls them back in. He's like, brothers, like, listen, I'm with you. I'm with you, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. He's saying, everyone in this room, salvation has come. 
And salvation has a name and it's Jesus. And he's trying to draw them into this story. But then he's also going to talk through what, what happened when Jesus eventually does come down that mountain of olives and, and makes his way into Jerusalem. It wasn't all just a happy time. No, that Passion Week was full of brutality. Verse 27, he says, For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, they did not recognize Jesus, nor understand the utterances of the prophet, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. What he's saying here would not have been lost on his audience. He's saying, listen, you know what the prophets have said. You know that there's one who is to come. We read this every Sabbath that we get together, and still they missed it, just like you're in danger of missing it too. Verse 28, and though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and they laid him in the tomb. So connecting all these dots, he's building up to this moment. He said God's promises have been proven true over and over and over again. And he promised a Messiah to come, and that Messiah has come, but he was rejected in Jerusalem. He was hung on a cross, cursed on that tree, and eventually he was laying in a tomb. See, it brings us back to the, the confusion of Palm Sunday, right? As Jesus is riding in on that donkey and everyone's cheering, often our question is, how can just days later people now be condemning him to death? How can they be jeering and, and asking for him to be crucified? But I think if we just take a look around at our culture, it's not that hard to imagine, <laughs> Right? I mean, it used to take, you know, a, a few days for someone who was of good character to be assassinated uh, in their character, right? But now it takes one conversation, one news clip taken out of context, one small storyline, and we flip on people just like that. So when we read the gospel accounts, we should not be surprised at how fickle people are because we're still the same and we're just as fickle. And so Paul is pointing out here, this crowds were coming in and they rejected the one who was to come. Salvation had come, but it was rejected. At first there was rejoicing, then there was rejection, and then Jesus himself was laying in a tomb. And he's pulling them in saying, do you see, you see what's happened here? And just about the time you think that it's impossible and we've, we've messed up so bad that there's no going back, he brings in verse 30 and he says this, but God, anytime you see that phrase, you should just start clapping, right? Like if you're in the movie theater, you're like, here we go, you know, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, that he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus. I mean, Paul is, do you have any word of encouragement, Paul? He's like, yes, right? He's coming alive in this moment. I've got lots to say to you right now. Because this promise that God fulfilled, you, you thought you had destroyed. He was laying in the tomb. But no, God raised him up again that we can have life in him. And more than that, he appeared to many. Not just a couple of people, but he appeared all over the place. What Paul is saying here is that you can go. You can go to Jerusalem and you can probably talk to somebody who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. Right? This is still in the time frame where those who witnessed the resurrection were still alive. They were still walking around. So if someone was like, no, 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 Jesus really rose from the dead. And people were like, you're a liar. There'd be people that were like, no, 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 I, I saw him. I saw him. And so he made his, himself known to those around. And now uh, Paul is coming. And he, it's almost like he can feel what, what the crowd's about to say back to him. Like, again, this is too unbelievable. And so now he's going to start kind of riffing through scripture. And like, let me just give you some, some points that will help to point to the truth of who Jesus is. And so he says, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessing of David. Therefore, he says, also in another Psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. Verse 36, for David had... After he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. This is death, that word corruption there. 
Because death is a, is a corruption of what was meant to be. Death is a disruption of what was meant to be. It was not the design. We brought that upon ourselves and we continue to bring that upon ourselves. And so Paul here is quoting, he, he quotes from Psalm 2, 7. He quotes from Isaiah 55, 3. He quotes from Psalm 16, 10. He's bringing together all these different passages. He's saying this, this is the truth. See how this is all lining up to point us to who Jesus is. And then verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. See, right there, everything would have gotten really quiet. Because for them, the law of Moses, for, for us, we don't just ignore the law of Moses, but we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law of Moses. But for them, sacrifice was required. Payment was due to the debt that we owed. We could never be perfect. There was things that you had to go through. And now here he's saying, no, no, everyone who believes in this Jesus, this Messiah is free. Sacrifices no more because he's paid it in full with his own life on our behalf. This is the gospel message that, that Paul is proclaiming to this group in this moment. This is where he's inviting them in to, to make that decision. Okay, are you going to step forward in this? Or how are you going to take this? But he's putting it out there because it's too good of news to keep to himself. He's inviting as, as many people as he can into the goodness of who Jesus is. And so again, even as he's proclaiming this radical truth that, this, that Jesus is for everyone, Right? Wheels are spinning for those who are Jewish. Like, wait, but we're the chosen people. You just told us we were called by God for these specific things. And now you're saying this truth is for everyone. And so he quotes from the prophet Habakkuk. Who Habakkuk would, would give a proclamation of something unexpected that God would do when he would use foreign nations to judge the people of God. And, and no one had a category for that. And so Paul brings that story in. He's like, so beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophet should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. And so Paul is using the words of the prophets. He's like, you're not going to believe what I'm saying to you because it's, it feels so contrary. It feels so different. But this is the truth. This work is so radical that this good news has come and that this good news is available to God's chosen people, that this good news is available to all nations. Verse 42. So he leaves that there. We don't, we don't get like the immediate response, but we start to see what happens in this crowd. And we're going to see kind of the initial excitement of what happens. Verse 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. Right? I mean, it's how you guys leave every Sunday. They're like, Andrew, just, just a little more, right? We can't wait to come back. Just, just, just keep going longer, right? No, that, this truth was so impactful in this moment. They're like, we, we, we haven't heard this before. We haven't heard this put like this before. We, we need this. So please come back. We want to hear more. And there's this fervor. There's this excitement. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. They're just like hanging out with them the rest of the week. These guys are like rock stars all of a sudden. They're like, we want what you have. And what do they do? Again, Paul and Barnabas are so good at deflecting. It's not about them. It's what God is doing in and through them. And so they urge them to continue in the grace of God, continue in the unmerited favor of God. This gift that he has given you, hold tight to that truth. And I think they, they urge them here because they know how fickle our minds are. That the excitement that has come in this moment can so quickly flee. That when, when they step away from the synagogue and all that they've heard is so transformative and then life hits them the next day when they go to work and they realize, well, well is it that good a news? I mean, how quickly the worries of this world choke out even the smallest seed of faith. And so they urge them, lean in. This truth that you are experiencing is, is true today and it's true forever. But as we've seen throughout the book of Acts, 
we see this push and pull. We see this movement that anytime we move forward, suddenly there's usually a push backwards. Opposition is going to come. In verse 44, we read on, and it says, The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Can you imagine this? This synagogue, suddenly the whole city is hearing about this, descending on this place, like ready to hear this message that is just racing through all of Antioch at this moment. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. So here comes the opposition. They see this. They're curious. What is this, this news? But then suddenly they realize, if, if people start to listen to this, if people really step in and, and follow this Jesus, this is going to change everything. And this is actually going to take away some of our influence in the ways in which we've been operating. And so suddenly they start to push back. They're like, no, no, no. We want to keep control of what we have here. And so they start to come after Paul in this moment. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. I mean, this is such a, a significant moment. This is such a significant shift here. Like, fine, if you don't, if you don't want to hear this, if you're judging yourself, and, and they're quick to say, like, we're not, we're not putting this on you. You're putting this on yourself, that you are unworthy to accept this eternal life that Jesus has just offered to you. Okay, we're going to turn to the Gentiles because they, they are experiencing something here. There's a movement happening here, and we're going to lean all in. And so they continue on, verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. See, Paul and Barnabas knew the trajectory of the good news. It wasn't something to be held captive. It was something to be lit on fire and let free. And it was to the ends of the earth, to, to all people. You can hear the echoes of Isaiah 49, 6 in this passage. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That this news may travel far and wide. As I was reading through this, I heard echoes of the voice of Simeon. If you're reading along with us in our reading plan, and we were in Luke 2 this week, which feels a little foreign to be reading around the Christmas passage uh, right now as we're preparing for Easter. But there's this moment where Simeon, this elderly man, he, he grabs hold of Jesus as he's a, is an infant, and he lifts him high, this promise that God had given him. And we read these words in Luke 2, 29. It says, Lord now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. See, Simeon caught it. He saw the blessing that was to be, the glory that was to be for the Israelites, the chosen people of God. But he also saw this was not to be contained. That this was the revelation for all people. The light for all people. The hope for all people. See, hope has come. Light has come. And in this moment, the tipping point has come. See, when the, when the Gentiles heard this, verse 48, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to the eternal life believed. There's this moment of, of, of just fervor, of excitement that they were included, that God would have this miraculous plan for their life. And then it says this. It says, as many as were appointed to eternal life uh, believed. And now some grab hold of that, that, that appointed, that elected. That's where we get into some of the conversations of God's sovereignty. And so did he just make this so? And what I love that we see throughout the book of Acts is that we see God has the ability to just say, yes, I'm going to make this so. And he also has the ability to say, are you going to choose me or not? And everyone likes to push on that and be like, well, which one is it? Both. God can do both because he's God and we are not. And so in this moment, they're choosing. In this moment, as they're hearing the, the word come to them, they're stepping into life with him. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. They're like, okay, we're done with these guys. 
So their plan was they incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city. Now you might wonder, like, how were they able to do this? Well, the Roman culture was just a, a horror show. I mean, so twisted in the way in which they, they treated one another, so twisted in the way in which they, they viewed one another sexually. I mean, sex was, was power, but the, a wife of someone in high standing just kind of had to bear with the fact that her husband was going to have other people that he slept with all the time. And so what we see early in history is that there was a lot of women in high standing in the Roman culture that found the way of, of the Jewish way of life to be a simpler, better way where it was, it was pure. And so they would come and they would take part in the synagogues. They often uh, were benefactors to the, to the synagogues that they would help to, to keep those afloat because they so appreciated the fact that the, the image of God, that we were all image bearers of God, was treated with a greater respect than the Roman culture. And so what we see here is these Jewish leaders are, are leaning on these women of like, listen, we know your husbands are in high places and if you really enjoy what's happening here and, and the way in which we've been operating, then you're going you're gonna to kind of lean on your husband to, to make him do something to get these guys out of here, right? So they're taking advantage of the connections that they have to push uh, these guys out of there. And, and meanwhile, we have the Gentiles rejoicing, and we have the, the Jewish reaction of just trying to get rid of them. And Paul and Barnabas continue to experience the push and pull of ministry. The, the tragedy and the triumph of lives being changed. Because so often those come hand in hand. As one person steps in and receives, another person steps back and rejects. And the tipping point has been reached. As the Jews are saying, nah. And the Gentiles are all in. See, and this is our experience still. For wide is the path that leads to destruction and narrow is the path that leads to life. Opposition will come. Pushback will occur. We still have a choice to make. Are we going to be in with him or are we going to retreat back? Charles Spurgeon says this so well. He says, wherever there is likely to be great success, the open door and the opposing adversaries will both be found. If there are no adversaries, you may fear that there will be no success. A boy cannot get his kite up without wind, nor without a wind which drives against his kite. A contrary wind is much more for us than we suppose. Adversaries advertise the gospel, and so spread it. Opposing work, although in itself evil, is wondrously overruled by God for the best purposes, since persecution often arouses natural sympathy and this becomes a ladder by which love climbs up into the heart. What Spurgeon is saying so well here is opposition is going to come. But when you are holding tight to the truth of who Jesus is, that truth will soar even in the face of opposition. That truth will not waver. And so Paul and Barnabas have come. They've proclaimed the truth of who Jesus is. They've seen some accept that. They've seen some reject that. And as they're being booted from the city, we're told in verse 51, but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and they went to Iconium. I mean, this is old school prophets right here, just kicking off the dust of the city that won't receive them. Okay, we did all that we could. And now it's up to God to overcome what, what you refuse. And so they just kick off the dust. And they head off to Iconium, that place that we're going to look at in a couple weeks as to where they go. But before we, we jump uh, there, we got to finish this. Verse 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Those who'd come to follow in the way of Jesus in these moments, even in the midst of the opposition and the chaos that was swirling in Antioch, what was their experience? It was joy. And they were filled with the Spirit. Because opposition, yes, will come. But even in the midst of that, we hold on to the truest truth that I know. And it's unwavering. It's unshakable. And so we can ex still experience joy even in the midst of the press against us. It doesn't mean we put on the plastic smile and pretend. It means that even in our sorrow, we can trust that he is there with us. It means even in our pain, 
And he's not absent. And he's walking alongside us. So, so what do we do with this? What do we take from this moment where, where Paul now comes and proclaims this truth and we see this varied reaction where it almost seems like revival is going to break out and then all of a sudden chaos ensues, but the, the name of Jesus is proclaimed. There's just a few observations that I, that I make along the way. The first is this. We, we see Paul and Barnabas take a risk. They're willing to take a risk. They hold on to the line of the kite and they preach the truth and they let it soar. Come what may. I mean, I have to imagine as we read through all the accounts of Paul, that there had to be at some point this moment where as he's sitting there and, and he's dressed the part of rabbi and they're like, hey, rabbi, do you have something that you would like to share? That he just wanted to like pull out his greatest hits and just like say a funny story and everyone be like, I like that Paul guy and walk out of a synagogue without people wanting to beat him. Right? Like just once. Just to win the crowd over and be like, that was, that was good. But no, we, we don't see that. They don't see, we don't see them preaching for their own ends. No, they're like, we've got an open audience. We're going to proclaim the truth of Jesus. And we're going to try and help connect the dots as best we can because everybody needs Jesus. And so we're going to proclaim that. And we're going to let that lie wherever it is, even if it offends. This is hard. It doesn't mean that we should always be offensive in the way we proclaim the gospel and just like yell at people and run away. No, it means we should be winsome still, season that with salt, but I know what that's like when you're about to share something with someone that you know is, it has the potential to offend them, right? Our, our throat gets a little bit tighter in that moment. But if we believe that this is good news, and it's good news for everyone, the risk is worth it. So we see Paul and Barnabas are willing to take that risk. What we also see is him hammer on this truth that we need to hear over and over again. We proclaim this every week, but we still need to hear it over and over again that the law cannot free us. Our own efforts cannot free us. Being a good person cannot free us. It is Jesus alone that frees us. It is Jesus alone that saves us. That's what we need. We see this, that opposition will come. And when it comes, particularly when it comes to the tipping point, that moment of decision, we cannot make a decision for anyone but ourselves. This one's hard. There are many people I know, many people that I love that I wish I could make this decision for. That I just wish I could, I could do something to be like, no, you don't understand what you're missing and what Jesus has to offer for you. You don't understand the gift that he is bringing before you. I cannot decide that for them. I can only decide that for myself. And my hope and my prayer is that for each of us, that when we choose that, that we don't just do it halfway, that we do it wholly and completely and we go for it. We take hold of that kite and we let it fly as high and as loud and as, as all over the place as we can and let it sing. But we don't get to choose for others. We can only make that decision for ourselves. And finally, we've, we've talked around this already, but we see that even in opposition, we can experience joy, which sounds so foreign, right? When people are pushing up against you, when just life is pushing up against you. Now, I was hearing a story of, of grief recounted this week in a family that's experiencing deep loss, but when the family was finally united, grandkids got to see their grandfather and someone was telling me that story and the joy of that moment, I, I was gone. Because that presence is so powerful. And that's what God offers to us, that his presence is always with us, even in the most uh, deepest parts of our pain and our, our opposition and our sadness. That we can still live in the assurance and hold tight to that truth of who he is. See, what we see in this, this playing out here in this moment, all the commotion, that the chaos that's happening in, in Antioch of Pisidia, it, just, it really does take me back to the Passion Week. That moment as Jesus is coming down the hill and people are proclaiming him as king, they're crying out, Hosanna, they're saying, Lord, save us. No, we're in, we, we're with you. And later it's the very same people that will bring about his death. But the hope of all humanity had come. The one who would bring life was laying in the tube. The, the very light of the world was experiencing darkness. 
But as Paul reminded us, but God raised him from the grave. And to some, this message is life. It's what we cling to. It's what we find hope in. And to others, this comes with the aroma of death and rejection. And so the question before each of us is what do we believe? And not only what do we believe, but what do we live? Do we live this truth in our lives? Do we let it sink down into us? Because Paul and Barnabas remind us that the work that we get to be a part of, it's not always easy. It's not always clean. It's not, it's not always glamorous. So often we read of these miraculous moments in Scripture, but we don't see the full backstory behind it. We don't get to hear of all the, the ways in which the boat ride there was probably a tumultuous affair and that walking up and hiking up that treacherous place. Who knows if there were bandits or brigands? We don't have the story. We do know at some point Paul was sick on this journey and still he continued forward. See, we don't have the backstory, but all we see is that they thought the risk was worth the reward of, of proclaiming the news of Jesus to everyone that they could. So as we take hold of the kite string, we know that the wind will come. But we also know the truth will rise in the wind of opposition and soar. And when we see the tipping point in our lives, my hope, my prayer is that we would take hold of Christ choosing him this day and every day, and with joy, letting the truth of Christ soar. You pray with me. Father, as we are just reminded of the goodness of you, Lord, I'm also aware, just as, as Paul was so aware of the questions that push back against your truth, that there's many who find this too good to believe. That this is a truth for others, but not for them. But Lord, I pray that each of us in this room would recognize that you've come and your offer stands before each of us, that we could have life in you, eternal life in you, but that we don't have to wait for that life but we can begin to experience the joy of knowing you here and now. And so God, I pray that you would be ever present to us, that you would help us to be bold in our proclamation of who you are, that we would speak your truth with our, with our words, with our lives, with our actions. And God, those moments that we have to invite others into life with you, would you make that clear? And would you give us a confidence and a boldness that is far beyond our own because your spirit is moving within us. And Lord, for any here yet to turn to you, would they know that today could be that day where they turn and find life in you. That your forgiveness covers all. That you have paid the debt in full. And so, Jesus, we proclaim that you are the Messiah, the risen one, in whom we find life. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. But our hope is that as we awaken to this truth, is that as we choose to follow in the way of Jesus this day and every day, that we would experience the joy that comes from him, that it would well up inside of us and be so contagious that others could see and experience and choose for themselves the hope that is found in him. And if you have yet to make that decision, we'll be down here up front. We'll be praying for you if you need prayers. But if you want to talk around who Jesus is and what that looks like for you to step in with him, we'd love to have that conversation with you. And for those of you who've stepped in with him, you are released from here today as his ambassadors to awaken the people around you, to awaken this community to the truth of who he is. So let us go and let us make much of Jesus in all things. And we go in his grace and his peace. God bless you. And we'll see you on Friday and on Sunday. And in the next...